Good morning and welcome to today's Sunday School lesson for March the 20th. I am Lee Hunt, Worship Minister here at Boone's Creek Christian Church, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Now our text today may be pretty familiar to those of you who have been in the church uh, for quite a while, but I want us to take a fresh look at it and really dive into all of its importance. Now, if you've not been a Christian for a while or, or maybe not at all, what a great time for you to discover something foundational to our faith and for you to discover just how much you are loved. This passage is found in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Luke 22, 14 through 20. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version this morning. I'll give you a few minutes to locate that in your Bibles or your mobile app. Luke 22, 14 through 20. You know, memory is a funny thing. As I get older, I find out just how funny of a thing it can be. I mean, we all know that from time to time, things can slip our mind. We can't remember a name. We can't remember where we put our car keys, where we put our phone. So it must be our spouse's fault, right? They must have hid it from me. I mean, there's even advertisements out there for memory aid supplements. Even some made from jellyfish because nothing screams memory like a jellyfish. Our memories tend to be fickle. I mean, I can remember almost every single jingle from every commercial for every product I've ever seen from about the mid 70s up through uh, the late 90s. But sometimes I can't seem to remember the person's name I just met 20 minutes ago and talked to for 20 minutes. I know some of you are right there with me. Well, I am going to be talking about memory for just a little bit this morning, but we're going to be diving into so much more. I mean, most of us have something, whether it's uh, an event, a birthday, a wedding date, a tragedy, a life altering occasion that at the time we could never picture ourselves not having it at the forefront of our mind. For me, it was, it was 9-11. I remember everything about that day. I, I passed a teacher in the hallway. I was a teacher at the time. And he knew I had just been up to the World Trade Center. And he said, hey, did you hear that a, a Cessna hit one of the towers? And we kind of laughed about that for a minute because how could anybody miss one of those towers? Well, I went to my classroom and I told the principal about it. He came to my classroom because I had the biggest TV in the school and we were going to watch it together. As soon as we turned it on, we thought, oh, that looks bigger than a Cessna. Well, we discussed it for a few minutes. My class started walking in and we were wondering what we were watching. And then suddenly uh, the second plane hit. And an absolute sickening feeling came over me. Mr. Strickland and I looked at each other and we realized we were under attack. Well, for the next several hours, we watched in horror as news of other attacks came in. People were crying. Everyone talked about how their lives were, were going to be vastly different. Nothing would ever be the same again. We could not picture life returning to normal ever. The images we were seeing would probably never leave our brains. And for the first few months and weeks after that, that was true. It's all we thought of. The news had it on daily. It was the number one story every day. Now, I don't remember when it happened, but sometimes, sometime in the first six months, I realized I went a day without thinking about it. And then later, I went a few days without thinking about it. And within a few years, I found myself going long periods of time without thinking about 9-11. And it seemingly didn't even have an impact on my life anymore. I mean, just a few short years after 9-11, most of the world had moved on. The further we were in time away from this life-altering event, the less we remembered it. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, it's a good thing God the Father understands how memories work I mean, he made us. Now, in one aspect, many view our memory problems as a merciful defense mechanism that God built into us so that, so that we don't have all the terrible tragedies at the forefront of our mind every day. Also maybe keeps us from uh, idolizing a particular moment in time. Other experts say that, well, our memory problems really stem from, from being too busy, for having too many things in our head. 
Uh, either way, I'm not here to discuss the why of our memory problems. I'm here to discuss our loving, gracious, merciful Father and how He deals with our forgetfulness. You see, God has done incredible things for us as, as mankind. He created us. Uh, he set His people free from capti captivity. He gave His people incredible victories over their enemies. And He had His Son die for us. But even though He's done these absolutely incredible things, his people tend to forget about them very quickly. They start griping, they start complaining, or maybe even turning from God altogether. So God gives his people reminders of just what he's done and reminders of his promises. I'm going to give you just a few examples from Scripture of how God has given his people reminders to remember these huge things he has done. For instance, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 12 through 16, most of us know this. God gives, God gives mankind the symbol of a rainbow. It's a promise to never destroy the earth again by flood. And Christians today, when we see a rainbow, we're reminded of that promise. In Exodus chapter 12, God sets up the Passover. It becomes a ceremony to remind his people how the Lord passed over the houses of the Israelites that had blood on their door frames. The ceremony served as a lasting reminder that God had rescued his people. And it becomes a foreshadowing of Jesus, who is the ultimate Passover lamb. Over in Exodus 13, God sets, God sets up the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was observed every year. And it was a time where the bread is served without anything to make it rise. It's so it will remind his people of the haste in which they were set free from Egypt. Then in Numbers 15, the Lord directs his people to make tassels on their garments and to have a blue cord on each tassel. Now this was done to be a constant reminder of the Lord's commands. Over in Joshua chapter 4, the Israelites cross the Jordan over into the promised land. As they're crossing through the Jordan on dry land, Jordan, uh, Joshua tells the Israelites to go grab one stone, one for each tribe, and set it up as an altar. It would be a reminder of how God had parted the Jordan the same way that he had parted the Red Sea in order to set his people free and bring them into the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. Then in 1 Samuel 7, uh, the Lord delivers the Philistines into the hands of the Israelites in a great battle. So Samuel sets up a stone between Mitzpah and Shen, and he calls that stone Ebenezer. You remember here the song here, I raise my Ebenezer. It's a reminder of what the Lord has done. Ebenezer means the Lord has helped us. Now I could go on, but suffice to say, the Lord has not only done many great things for his children, he's tried to ensure they would not forget what he's done and then wander away. So with that in mind, let's take a look at today's scripture that points out probably the greatest thing the Lord has ever done. We find it in Luke chapter 22, 14 through 20. This is Jesus with his disciples. Verse 14 says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant or new promise or new contract in my blood, which is poured out for you. So right off the bat in verse 15, Jesus makes reference to the Passover we talked about a few minutes ago. And he's saying the Passover is ready to find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is telling them that right now we're celebrating this Passover meal together, but it's getting ready to be ultimately fulfilled when I, Jesus, the Passover lamb, shed my blood. The blood will be a new contract between my father and you. 
Anyone covered by my blood will be passed over from eternal punishment and will instead be in my father's kingdom. Then in verse 19, Jesus breaks bread and gives it to him. And he says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's saying, I'm getting ready to give my body over to God's wrath that you all deserve. I'm going to give myself in your place so you never have to experience the punishment you deserve. This bread is my body. Every time you do this, remember what I'm doing for you. And then in verse 20, he again makes reference to the blood. He gave everyone the cup of the fruit of the vine and tells him this is his blood, which is poured out for them. Jesus says, I'm going to give up my blood to cover your sins so that when God the Father looks at you, he only sees my goodness and not your sins and mistakes. And then remember, as you drink this cup, I want you to remember everything that it stands for and what I'm doing for you. So then, taking the bread and the cup reminds us of the greatest act of love in the history of mankind. It reminds us that Jesus saved us even while we were still enemies of God so we could be brought back to the Father. Every time we take of the bread and the cup, we're reminded of Jesus' Jesus's sacrifice and his love for us. However, communion or the Lord's Supper is so much more than a reminder of what the Lord has done. I mean, that would have been enough, but it's so much more. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, Paul is explaining to the church in Corinth how important the Lord's Supper is and the right way in which to partake in it. Paul says, Then the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This is what we just talked about. I broke it down from, chapter, from Luke. But I want you to notice what he says in the very next verse. Verse 26, Paul says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do you understand what Paul was saying there? Not only are we remembering what Jesus did when we take the bread and the cup, we are actually proclaiming what he did to other people. When we take it, it is its own message to the world of, hey, look what Jesus did for you. He loves you this much. And then it even goes one step further. It says we're to do this until the Lord, the Lord returns. There is no stopping point. This is a remembrance that's supposed to keep on going. But it's a remembrance with a promise. And the promise is he is coming back. He's coming back for those who are his to live with him forever. And we're to proclaim that promise that he is coming back. That's what we're doing when we're taking communion. This just keeps getting better and better. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 16 through 17, Paul writes, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share in the one loaf. So not only are we remembering, not only are we proclaiming, not only are we looking for his promised return. Paul says we are actually participants in the body and blood of Christ. And then no matter where we are in the world, he says there's only one bread, there's only one cup. So you're participating in the body as a globally unified church. Isn't that incredible? How awesome is the Lord to not only remind us of how great his love is, but then to also help us in sharing this story of love and then giving us a promise of his return and then unifying us as we participate in his body and blood. 
Well, as I wrap this up, I want to cover just a few more items very quickly. For instance, is there any instruction as to how often or when we should participate? Because scripture really doesn't give us detailed instructions on this. However, the restoration churches of which BCC is a, is a part of, we take our cues from, from scripture based on a few scriptures that indicate what the earliest Christians did in the book of Acts. For instance, in Acts 2, 42 through 47, verse 42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were devoted. You catch that word being devoted. They were devoted to the practice of taking communion and remembering what Jesus did for them. And then in verse 46, it says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And so there are many that think this is an indication that they may have done this as often as every day. So there certainly doesn't seem to be anything wrong with remembering what Jesus has done for us every single day. But Acts 20 verse 7 maybe helps us set up at least the, the minimum of how often. Verse 7 says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Did you catch that? On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. It appears that the early Christians met at least on the first day of the week, specifically to break bread, to share in communion, to remember what Jesus did, to proclaim his sacrifice and be united with other believers everywhere. Now, once again, this is not a thou shalt command, but based on scripture, we believe this is a very good place to start. And then lastly, in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32, Paul gives us some warnings about how to participate in communion, how to participate in the bread and the cup. It's not supposed to be something that's done just flippantly. Verse 27, he says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That's pretty serious. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So it's extremely important that we're not just flippantly taking the, the bread and the cup and thinking about other, everything else. We're supposed to specifically recognize the body and blood of Christ and what he has done for us. Because it says if we don't, we're guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Christ. Now, it's my hope that in this brief study uh, that your, your viewpoint on this has been uh, freshened up. And you look on this scripture and it will help remind you the incredible love and the incredible sacrifice that was given to you by Jesus. And I hope I want I hope you'll ask yourself some questions like, how can I pass the importance of the Lord's Supper on to my family or others? I hope you'll also take some time and reflect on what the Lord's Supper really means between you and God the next time you have the opportunity to participate in taking the bread and the cup. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for uh, realizing that, that we have so many issues with our memory and we are so busy and we just have a hard time remembering even the great things. So I'm glad, Father, you gave us the bread and the cup to remind us of the greatest act of love ever, Jesus dying for us. And Father, you didn't stop with just reminding us. You, you, you help us now proclaim that message to others. You give us the promise that you're coming back for us. And it is a way to, for us to participate with other Christians all around the world in celebrating what Jesus has done. Father, may we never take that for granted and take advantage of the Lord's Supper every time it is presented to us. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a very blessed day.